Today we begin a new sermon series, one that will take us through the end of the church calendar before the new year starts at Advent. The series is called Devoted, and we will explore what it means to be a disciple of Christ. We will think about how discipleship is not just a call toward belief, but a call of action. We will ask the question, what does it mean to be devoted to our faith? Over the next seven weeks, we will explore how we are called to take our faith seriously, to take faith home, to wrestle with God, to affirm resurrection hope, to practice generosity, live by faith, and make Christ central. We will think about what Jesus was really asking of us when he said, follow me. To follow Jesus isn't just to take one step in the right direction. Following implies that it is a continuous motion. It is an ongoing journey. Today's text is not an easy one to think about it. It isn't one of the feel-good passages of the Bible. It's one that challenges us, makes us think about what Jesus meant when he said these words. It's one that makes us take a close look at our own lives and faith. Jesus begins by addressing the crowd that was following him, and he said, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Now you may be thinking, Whoa, Jesus, I thought loving my family was a good thing. It is. Please don't hear me incorrectly. What we have to remember is, as scholar Mark Rawls points out, in Jesus' time, the rabbis spoke in hyperbole. That is, they made use of bold exaggeration for dramatic effect. Jesus was speaking in front of a large crowd, and he used this shock value to get his point across. It wasn't literal, and that may seem strange to us but it was used and accepted back then. His point was not that we should actually hate our family, but that there may be times when we are called to be opposed to someone, to go against what they believe to be right or what they want us to do. We must be willing to follow God first. Now, in my family, we tell the kids that we try not to use the word hate. We may dislike something or disagree, but we emphasize that hate is a very strong word. Jesus' ethic of love makes it impossible for him to ask us to hate. God is love. So to put it another way, if something is not based in love, it is not of God. The word hate used in this text is the Greek word miseo. What this word implies in this situation is to denounce or to renounce one choice in favor of another. So what this passage is saying through this exaggerated hyperbole is that we may be called to make a hard decision. Thankfully, Jesus says more. He doesn't just leave us there. Jesus continues with a few examples, such as a builder who examines the cost before he begins construction on his tower, or a king who considers the possible outcomes before opposing another king. In both of these examples, the person pays attention. They seriously consider what they are getting themselves into. They weigh the costs and the outcomes before making a decision. Now, the builder doesn't know if there will be surprise costs, but he knows his trade. He knows how much the materials will be and the price of the labor. The king doesn't know exactly how each of his soldiers will perform, 
but he knows the training that they have completed. In both of these examples, they are called to make a choice given the knowledge that they had at the time. These examples make me think of a podcast that we listened to along with our book study the other week. Kate Bowler, who wrote the book Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved, was talking with a friend of hers, Ray Barfield, who is a pediatric oncologist. He mentioned that one of the practices he has is to have parents take note of the time and the day that they make a decision regarding a treatment plan. And he points out to them that they are making the best decision they have with the information they had at that time. When we choose to follow Jesus, we don't know exactly what we will be called to do in our lives, but we can look ahead. We can pay attention. We can consider the choices that we may be asked to make. Now, we already make choices and sacrifices in our lives. When we join a sports team, we make sacrifices agreeing to get out and play on their schedule no matter the weather. When we become parents, we know we will make sacrifices for the betterment of our kids. When we play an instrument, we make sacrificing, sacrifices choosing to practice when we could be doing other things. When we commit to a healthier lifestyle, we make sacrifices, paying to join a gym or forgoing that piece of chocolate cake. Are we making similar sacrifices for our faith? When Jesus says, follow me, we have to ask ourselves the question, what am I willing to give up? What serious commitment am I willing to make? Am I willing to commit to be at church on Sundays? Well, people are generally okay with that commitment. Am I willing to go against society and follow Jesus' call for justice and peace? Well, that one's a little harder. Am I willing to change my job and start a ministry? Not everyone's called to that, don't worry. But some are. Discipleship may cost relationally. You may realize that some people are not the best influence in your life. Discipleship may cost you financially as you support church and charities. Discipleship may cost you time and energy as you share your gifts with the world. As I was reading about the text this week and this cost of discipleship, as many scholars called it, I read an example that I want to share with you. In the midst of the civil rights movement, people were called to commit to the work of justice before they knew what it would cost them. They agreed to nonviolence even as they had to endure much violence. They committed to boycott the buses and ended up walking to their jobs for 381 days. Now, when they agreed, they knew that they may be walking for a week or a month, but I doubt many of them expected to walk for over a year. But they made that difficult choice, and they committed. How do we do this? How do we prepare ourselves to make these hard choices, these serious commitments, and these daily commitments? First, we prepare ourselves in the best way that we can, and we open ourselves to growth. There was a woman named Cheryl Strayed who spent a summer hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. She prepared herself, getting the equipment she needed and organizing food for along the way. And as she started, she realized her bag was too large and her boots were too small. She was sore and uncomfortable. She had prepared her supplies, but not herself, physically and emotionally, but she persevered. She opened herself to grow and found that the challenge brought out the best in her. Her body adapted and she kept walking. We can prepare ourselves on a journey of faith. 
We attend worship, we study scripture, we pray and we spend time with God. We may never be fully prepared for what lies ahead, but we try and we open ourselves to grow. Second, we remember that we are all in this together. Scholar Debbie Thomas describes a parable that is often told by Jewish rabbis that I think can help us understand this. She writes, A large multi-cabin ship sets sail across the ocean. A passenger whose cabin is on the lowest level of the ship decides to dig a hole in the floor of his cabin. Sure enough, the ship begins to sink. When the other passengers realize what happened, they rush into the man's cabin. What are you doing, they yell. The man looks up from the hole and says, well, it's my cabin. The decisions we make in our faith affect others. As Debbie writes, we're on God's ship now. We are responsible for one another. We think communally, not just individually. Disciples take faith seriously. They consider the commitment they have to make to follow Jesus. They realize that they may be called to make some hard choices. Jesus ends this speech to the crowd by stating, Therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Remember, this is still hyperbole. This is still a dramatic statement to get the point across, but his point is real and difficult. I think what Jesus is asking us is, are you willing to change, to choose, to make the serious and difficult commitment not only to believe, but to live your faith. Disciples take faith seriously. They pay attention. They prepare themselves and open themselves for growth. They remember that their decisions affect other people. And they make the serious commitment to follow Jesus not only in belief and words, but in action. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.